Miriam. Cleopas, Mary, what are you two doing back in Jerusalem? I thought you were going to Emmaus to stay. Miriam, we met someone on the road. We didn't recognize him at first, but... Miriam, we met Jesus. <gasps> Jesus? But he's... I've been looking and waiting ever since we found the stone rolled from the tomb. I still don't know where he is. But we do. A at least we did. Miriam, is it true that an angel told Mary he had risen from the tomb? Two angels. But yes, they said so. But we haven't been able to find him or his body. That's what we're trying to tell you. We've seen him. Where? Can you take me? Uh, well, no. <sighs> Here, sit down, Miriam. Let us tell you what happened. Cleopas, you tell it. Well, we were walking to Emmaus, and... We kept reliving that terrible day, that horrible injustice when Jesus was... You tell it, Cleopas. He never should have been crucified in that way. He never should have been arrested. He was betrayed by a... Betrayed by a coward. Well, go on. He never should have been crucified. It was horrible. It's inhuman. It's inhuman what these, what these Romans will do. And then he, well, you know, what a terrible moment when he died. Feeling the earth shake at the same time, it was a terrible day. At least Joseph stepped up and offered a tomb. Jesus couldn't stay like that over Passover. And then... And, and then we left for Emmaus, and as we were talking on the road, a stranger joined us, and he wanted to know what we were talking about, so we told him about Jesus. How he was so kind and loving and worked such miracles. No wonder the people loved him. Don't stop now, Cleopas. Remember what he said next? Yeah, he called us. What? <laughs> I know. But as he talked through the prophets, as he talked about things the prophets had said, Miriam, it made sense how Jesus would suffer and, and how people wouldn't believe and even how he would die. It was all there. We just hadn't seen it. And then? Well, by then we were near town, so we invited him to dinner. It was only polite, and we wanted to hear more. And we wanted to hear more. So, as we sat down to eat, he picked up the bread. He picked up the bread and blessed it. Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed is the one who makes us holy and brings forth bread from the earth. Then he went on. I thank you, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from those that think themselves wise and clever and have revealed them to those with childlike faith. That was Jesus' prayer. I know. And then he broke the bread. This bread, Miriam. And... And he vanished. Vanished? <laughs> Just like that. He was gone. And we knew. We knew that we had been with Jesus the whole time. So we hurried back to tell everyone, he is risen. Meeting him today mm. confirmed everything we hoped was true. He's alive, Miriam. Where is he now? I want to meet him too. You will, Miriam. You will. He will find you. And you can know for yourself that he is risen. Come on. Wow. Easter is about one thing. It's about what happened after a man was crucified, after he died on a cross. It's about an empty tomb. It's about people witnessing what that Jesus was alive. What Easter is not about is what comes out on social media or what comes out of Washington, D.C. 
And Easter is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and always will be. So what did it mean then and, and what does it mean now? I'd like to talk about that today. Um, I'm going to bring up an unpopular subject. So wait for it. Buckle up. Uh, I'm going to talk about death just for a moment. Now, it's something that every human being has to come to terms with. There is nothing you can do to stop it from happening. I mean, maybe you can prolong your life by taking care of yourself, eating well, exercising. Uh, you know, we try to do that. Uh, and all that's great. You may be able to make it less scary by keeping your mind busy on other things, accomplishments, goals, food, family, and simply try not to think about it. But eventually, it is going to happen to all of us. And is there anything at all that we can really do about it? Well, the answer lies in what we saw portrayed this morning, the empty tomb. That's where our answer is. So during one of our songs, it spoke of Mary Magdalene. And she was a woman who Jesus had healed of seven demons. This is the, the lady that, that came running up to the tomb during our song today. She came on that third day after Jesus was crucified. And here is the scripture that it's taken from. So I'd like to read that to you. It's John chapter 20, verse 1. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So to begin our investigation, we're going to... Uh, take a look at the Bible. We're going to find out evidence that the tomb in which, G in which Jesus was buried was discovered empty by Mary Magdalene and a couple other women on the Sunday following the crucifixion. And uh, we also know that uh, a few more apostles uh, found the empty tomb as well. So in Matthew 27, you can read on with me on the screen, it says this, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard... Pilate answered, go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. So we know from this scripture that Pilate, he was the Roman authority over the region. He made sure that no one was going to steal the body. And I'm going to read from Del Tackett's website. He's the author of the uh, Truth Project and Answers in Genesis. We've shown those videos here at Bethel Church. Uh, a wonderful teacher says this. This seal was most likely several ropes that were drawn across the stone and then affixed to the tomb walls with a soft clay imprinted with some symbol of authority. It was also likely that the ropes were also sealed at their juncture in front of the stone. And in this way, no one could move the stone or the ropes without breaking the dried clay and destroying the seal affixed upon the clay. The seal was there to put on notice that no one was to mess with the tomb. Rome could deal quite nastily with those who did so. Now, this doesn't mean much to us today, for we're long past the norm of using seals as they were utilized in ancient times. But in those days, a seal was inviolable. It represented authority, authenticity, and finality. No one messed with a seal. All right, so as to the question of what kind of a, a guard it was, because there is some debate over that, whether it was a Jewish guard uh, or whether uh, it was um, a, a Roman guard okay 
So Don Stewart of the uh, Blue Letter Bible website says this. There is a question as to which one of the two groups was watching over it. The context seems to favor the Roman guard. The Roman guard was a 16-man unit that was governed by very strict rules. Each member was responsible for six square feet of space. The guard members could not sit down or lean against anything while they were on duty. If a guard member fell asleep, he was beaten and burned with his own clothes. But he was not the only one executed. The entire 16-man guard unit was executed if only one of the members fell asleep while on duty. I don't know about you, but they couldn't have paid me enough to be a soldier uh, for, the, for the Romans. Uh, the disciples couldn't have stolen the body if they wanted to. That's the bottom line. The large stone was also sealed with Roman authority, and there was a guard placed at the tomb. No one was messing with the stone or the body. Not only that, but later on in their lives, because of their preaching on the resurrection, the disciples were beaten Ten of them were martyred and persecuted. Why would they die and be tortured for a lie? I, I wouldn't. I don't know about you. So at the very least, they believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. And in addition, the earliest Jewish arguments against Christianity admit the empty tomb. In Matthew chapter 28, it says that there's a reference made to the Jews' attempt to refute Christianity by saying that the disciples stole the body. So this is significant because it shows that the Jews also knew that the tomb was empty. So they're, they're trying to make up a reason why that it's empty. So I think logically it's safe to say that the tomb was empty. But why was it empty? Well, the Bible says that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Matthew 28, 5 through 7. I'm going to read a couple scriptures here. And there's many scriptures, by the way, that talk about Jesus being risen from the dead. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And in 1 Peter 1, 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So if he rose from the dead, wouldn't he have, be, have been seen by people, by his disciples? Seems like somebody would have seen him, you know. Well, there were. And so I'm going to go through some of these. First person I'm going to mention is Mary Magdalene, who we've talked about and portrayed. And uh, Mary, the mother of James. And just to let you know, there's a whole lot of Marys in the Bible. Uh, you should look. Uh, I've been quite amazed how many Marys there are and keeping them all straight in, in these stories. So, yes, these two ladies were um, in uh, John chapter 20, verse 10 through 18, uh, Jesus spoke to these two ladies. And the second instance refers to Cleopas and another disciple on the road to Emmaus. So Cleopas was uh, the gentleman portrayed in our skit here today. And the Bible says it was a man named Cleopas and another disciple. Many people think that it was his wife, uh, whose name was Mary. That's the third Mary we have today. Uh, and so uh, they were on the road to Emmaus. It's a town about 12 miles away from Jerusalem. And uh, they encountered the risen Christ, as they talked about in the skit. And it powerfully represented today these two sharing with another woman of their experience, which I can only imagine how exciting that would have been for them. All right. Uh, the next one is Peter. From Luke chapter 24, verse 34. Now, Peter is just briefly mentioned. Says that uh, the Lord appeared to Simon, who's also Peter. Uh, and then we have the ten apostles and others with Thomas absent. So we all know, or many of us know, about doubting Thomas. He really gets a bad rap in the scriptures. He really went through every, what everyone else did. He just did not believe 
when uh, the others told him that Christ was alive. And so uh, we find in the next one that Jesus does appear to Thomas and the other apostles in John chapter 20. And uh, Jesus shows him his hands and his feet. And, and uh, so then, you know, he's very nice to Thomas. But at the same time, he says, blessed are those who believe without seeing. And so that's a good challenge for us today. And so then we go to the seven apostles, John chapter 21. Now, I love this story, and I'm going to just tell it really quick because I love it. So these seven apostles, they were confused. They didn't know what was happening. Uh, so much had happened over the last several days. And, and like you, I'm sure... Sometimes when you're going through tough things, you do something that is familiar to you. And that's what they did. They fished. They went fishing. And so uh, that was comfortable for them. So they went out. And, of course, they didn't catch anything all night. And they hear a voice come from the shore yelling to them, throw your net out to the right side of the boat. So they did that. And, of course, tons of fish breaking the net. And so they knew that it was Christ who had said it. And Simon Peter, who was very impetuous, doesn't think to help everyone get the fish on the shore. He decides to jump off that boat and swim towards Christ. Uh, and so these seven apostles, they had breakfast with Jesus that morning. I love that story. And then the next one is he appeared to 11 apostles in Matthew chapter 28. Uh, he also appeared to the apostles at the Mount of Olives before his ascension into heaven. And I just wanted to add this one because we forget this. He appeared to more than 500 people at one time. And you're thinking, well, where does it say that in the Bible? Well, I'll tell you. Here it is. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. This is the Apostle Paul. He's saying, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still, are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So lots of people witnessed the risen Christ, and they spoke to him. Lots of people. But the truth of the matter is, I could go through every fact. I could really lay a convincing argument. I could logically prove that Jesus Christ was dead, placed in a tomb, and then the tomb was empty. The body not stolen, and that there is biblical record of many witnesses seeing him after his death. And some of these witnesses gave up their very lives because of what they had witnessed. But there still remains one thing. And you know, I can remember before I became a Christian that I asked people all kinds of questions and they would give me the best answers they could. But until I decided or that I knew it was time for me to commit my life to Christ... Um, they were just answers. And I always had another question, no matter how good those answers were. So there still remains one thing. What do you think? What do you think? Did Jesus Christ really rise from the dead? Is he alive today? Do you believe? So remember the beginning of our discussion that we all have to face the fact that we're all going to die at some point, but I'm just going to tell you today, there is absolute hope for every single one of us. And I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. John 11:25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, Yet shall he live. Everybody say that with me. Yet shall he live. One more time. Yet shall he live. 
Romans 8, 11 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You can have eternal life. You can live forever. I mean, that, there it is. Now I'm going to read one last scripture to you. It's very short. But this gives us the how-to in Romans 10. It says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All right, saved from what? What do you say from? You're saved from the consequences of sin. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin or what you get for sinning is death. But you can live forever. Now, look, I want to explain this to you. Look, God is holy and God is perfect. Okay? And we can always count on that. He's always going to know what's right. He's always going to know what to do. And whatever he, he knows is what's best. Okay? So he's holy. Well, the problem is, is we're not. Now, some of you out there, I know a lot of you, and you're pretty great. Uh, but you're not that great. And neither am I. Okay? Uh, believe me. That's, just ask my wife. Uh, no, we all are imperfect, and we all sin. And just to give another explanation of sin, it's, it's doing something or saying something, uh, acting um, in a way that doesn't live up to God's standard of perfection, holiness, morality, um, and goodness. Okay? So we all do that from time to time. And that presents a big problem. Because we want to live with God forever, yet God is holy. How can we, as sinful people, imperfect people, live in that environment? Well, God did something about that. Now look, you have God and us, and we have sin and he doesn't. So you've got this chasm that seemingly can't be um, bridged. But you know what? That's why we celebrate today. It really is. Because Jesus Christ lived a sinless life and he died on the cross as a sacrifice for your sin. And he did it way before you were ever born. You had absolutely nothing to do with it. He did it. And he died on that cross, rose from the dead, and now there's a bridge between God and man, and it's, the, and it's our Savior, Jesus Christ, is that bridge. So that's why we can go to heaven, because of the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ. So the empty tomb is a demonstration of Christ's victory over death. The cross and the empty tomb stand together logically and theologically. And I love that we have the simplicity of the cross and of the tomb on this Easter Sunday. On our own, we are helpless. And in dealing decisively with human sin, Christ has also dealt decisively with the problem of death. You can have eternal life. You don't have to be afraid anymore. Because Jesus Christ has crossed that bridge. And I want to talk to you just a little bit more. Because it's not just eternal life. When you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, something happens. It's not just a good idea. It's not just, well, I'm really going to try to do better. Well, well I'm really going to try to live a good life. That doesn't get you, that's not going to get you anywhere. Okay, when you ask Christ into your life, sincerely, 
something happens. And what that is, is the Holy Spirit, which was spoken of in this, in this scripture I spoke, I uh, read just a little while ago. It says the Spirit of Him, speaking of God the Father, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you. So when you ask Christ in your life, the Holy Spirit dwells in you, okay? And you will see things completely different. You're going to see things the way they really are. Now, until you do that, it's hard to understand what I'm talking about. I'm going to give just this little example, and I've thought about this many times, and I have mentioned it in this church, but... Many of you know the movie The Wizard of Oz from many years ago, the, the famous version and of, with Judy Garland. And the movie is in black and white, the beginning of it. Now, when they made this movie, color was new. And so this was a big deal. And so when Judy Garland is Dorothy, and she's flying around in that house. She lands on the, on the ground, and then there's that moment where she opens that door, and it's all beautiful color. Now, that's about as close as I can tell you as far as when you accept Christ into your life, something changes drastically, and you begin to see the world it's as if in color for the first time because that's who you were meant to be. You, you were meant to be a child of God and Christ has died and risen from the dead that you could be that child of God. And all you have to say is, God, I believe in you. And there's, there's a portion of that scripture that says, and we miss this a lot of the time, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Now, we pass that by, but that's important because that recognizes Jesus as uh, the Lord of your life. That means that he knows what's best and you're recognizing that. He knows what's best for your life and you believe in him. And so you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And... Uh, I wish that my words today could make all the difference in your life, but it's not going to be what I say. I've read the scriptures. I've tried to explain it the best I could. But in the end, the Holy Spirit's knocking at your heart's door. And I want to tell you something. If you have people praying for you, he's going to keep knocking. He's going to keep knocking until you say yes. And I want to tell you something. I remember thinking before I became a Christian at the age of 21, it's all about do's and don'ts. Oh, I can't do this anymore. Oh, I can't do that anymore. Oh, I can't. I was a music guy, and I, oh, I won't be able to do music anymore. Uh, well, there's certain music I don't do anymore, but <laughs> yes, that was a part of it. But uh, I didn't want to do that music anymore. And that's what happens is that God changes your heart so that you don't want to do those same things anymore. Okay? And it's beautiful. And he's wonderful and beautiful. And you're going to be able to see beauty in things you never saw beauty in before. Now, I'm going to have us all pray here in a moment. And many of you have been in a situation like this. I'm going to make, not going to make it uh, anything crazy different. But I just want to have us bow our heads this morning. So why don't you go ahead and just do that and just bow your head. And uh, I want to speak to those who have never accepted Christ into their life. You have never said uh, with sincerity... I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I believe that God raised him from the dead and that you want to give your life to him. And I think this if you do that today, it's going to be the greatest day 
of your life because it's going to change your eternity. So when I count to three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and nobody's looking around. I'm not going to call you out, anything like that. But I would like you to raise your hand just to, just to say, yeah, that's me. That's where I am. And then we're going to pray a prayer based on the scripture I read. So uh, I'm just going to count now. One, two, three. And just raise your hand. Amen. Just wait a few seconds longer. Amen. I see several over here on my left. Wait just a little longer. Thank you, everybody. All right, so I'm going to pray this prayer, and it's going to be solely based on this scripture. So if everybody could repeat after me with these uh, several of you that have raised your hand today. It's the best day of your life. Uh, so please pray this with me. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. I want to know you, God. Amen. Amen. All right, you can look up. Let's welcome these few that have accepted Christ. Now, I want to tell you something else. If you raised your hand today, that there's so many things that are going to be new to you and fantastic. Well, one thing is that you're going to be able to see sin like you've never seen it before. You're going to be able to see it everywhere. And it'll kind of blow your mind a little bit. But it's okay. You know why it's okay? is because you have people that can help you. All these people in this room who know Jesus Christ, see, all of a sudden, you have a new family. I'll never forget that. That's something I never thought about. I never thought would be a thing. And suddenly I realized they're everywhere. I can go into a store and I can hear somebody talking. Hey, you're my brother. You know, and I was, you know, a little over exuberant. And I would, people would go, whoa, whoa, whoa. But, <laughs> and I'm like, hey, I just accepted Jesus. Uh, you know, you're part of my family now. And they go, well, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but it's true. And and so we have this family to be able to count on and uh, be able to lift us up because you're going to need that. You're going to need that in your life, and you'll learn to encourage others and to, to help other people. It's all part of it. Uh, but you're on the most wonder, wonderful journey ever. And there's highs and lows, but the Holy Spirit of God will be with you. You'll have the Word of God, which you can get Right back there, we have materials, and we've had quite a few people take these materials already today, I've been told. Uh, we have them back at a table back there, and we want to help you. And if you'd like to talk to somebody about your decision today, whether you raised your hand or not, uh, there'll be people back there for you to talk to. But I do want to tell you, if you raise your hand today, please tell someone. Just say, look, I mean, however you want to say it. Uh, I accepted Jesus today. You may not know what all that means, but tell somebody that will help you. That will help you.